onto experimental physics. Um, the experimental team has spent most of the last 18 months figuring out how to diagnose the flyer performance, but then obviously the, their role is also to diagnose the, the target performance. So um, this shows the, the kind of real in situ setup for the flyer play experiments. Um, <coughs> so the machine has six fold symmetry, six modules. Um, and so we come in and we have, uh, if I come from the outside, we call these, the, uh, these bits of metal here the pizza slices. So there's six of those. Uh, they come into this piece of copper here. This is a mechanical fuse so that the section in the middle um, gets destroyed during the shot. Uh, but this is designed to break, which means this then doesn't break. Um, and then the actual load section in the middle is this hexagon in here. And then that takes the current round. And then underneath this black tube is where that um, flyer plate system uh, is located. Uh, the black tube is on there. Um, uh, to screen out all the various other plasma that comes from this system. So I suppose this is something that we have um, learned about um, machine three, uh, basically because it's, it's a high current machine and a long pulse, longer pulse machine. There is, firstly, because it has so much energy, its raw capability to turn metal into vapor is extremely, metal into plasma is extremely high. Um, and then, because the time is quite long, there is lots of time for that plasma to get to where you, exactly where you don't want it to be, like between two conductors so that it shorts out, or in front of your diagnostics. Um, uh, so the plasma will expand out into the vacuum chamber at 50 kilometers per second and include everything. So what we do is, for the optical diagnostics, we have this 3D printed tube which comes in here that actually mates directly onto the top of the, the target. So our standard diagnostic setup is we have the fly plate, it launches a, a, you know, a small distance, and then it hits into um, a block of um, PMMA, or, or Perspex, um, which uh, is transparent. So uh, the visor line, which comes in and down this tube, um, goes straight through the block, reflects off the flyer surface, and comes straight back out again without being disrupted. Um, and then uh, it allows us to measure the pressure on impact. So what we actually see in that block is the shock speed. And you can convert shock speed to pressure. The shock speed depends on the velocity, which we have an independent measurement of, although not always up to the time of impact. Um, uh, so it depends on the, the projectile velocity, but and also the projectile density. So we get a decent amount of information. The diagnostic tube literally touches and fits around the target. And it has two mirrors in the bottom there to allow the, um, uh, the backlit um, uh, imaging. Uh, so uh, the shock basically blocks the beam. Uh, we call it shockography. I don't know if it's really shockography, but um, and then the other thing we have um, is a wide field of view camera, which is just kind of a what happened, where did it go wrong kind of diagnostic. So um, first, uh, this is one of the videos we get from the wide field of view camera, um, which uh, I include because it's cool. <laughs> um, you don't really get much quantitative information from this, but you get a, you get a, get a sense, an intuition for like, what's actually happening. So this is one without the diagnostic tube on top, so we can see what happen, what's happening. And you can see what I mean about there's just plasma everywhere. Um, I'll let it play again. So this is where the flyer plate is. So you can see it kind of grows, and there's plasma, and there's something punches out at much higher velocity. Um, so that un underneath that cloud, in that cloud, is where the actual projectile is. Yeah, then in terms of um, kind of quantitative information, this is an example of the sort of uh, visor signal that we typically get. Um, so this is a 10 by 10 by 1 aluminium fly plate, um, like I was saying. It's kind of a standard thing. So um, it shows some typical features. So, well, firstly, here are the fringes. Um, and then you see the projectile starts to move. The front surface starts to move at this time. You see the fringes shifting. Um, and you, know, you count the fringe shifts and the velocity per fringe to give you the velocity. So this one got to about 4 kilometers per second. Um, before we lost signal. Um, so um, there's this period in here where we are not measuring the velocity, but before impact. Um, and so we think, by comparing through the simulations and um, a few bits of experimental evidence, we think that is a reduction in reflectivity as the front surface of the projectile melts. So um, this projectile is actually in quite a complex state, uh, which we try and understand if we're going to understand the performance of our targets. Um, <coughs> It also shows some other typical features. So we normally see loss of signal at the edges. We think because the projectile is distorting as it, as it flies up. Uh, it does so at the edges first, and the beam is reflected out of the uh, path of the collection optics. 
And we also see a bright flash, um, which is very tempting to think it's the projectile hitting into the target. Unfortunately, it's there when there's no target as well. So there's, there's at least two mechanisms for the production of that bright flash. So basically what we've seen is that, um, and what we see in the simulations is the projectile launches and um, there's side walls on the, on, the, on the projectile. And that helps stop the magnetic field coming around, from coming around the side until the projectile exits the chimney, we call it, uh, at which point it can then pinch, as all high current things eventually do. So uh, we think we've seen that in the imaging. And it looks like this flash is correlated with the pinching. And it's also, it, there's also a flash from impact. So it's hard to say what that is, but it's, pretty, it's, it's basically there in every shot we do. OK, uh, so that's the visor. And then this is an example of the streaked shotography that, um, uh, that we use. So we use a high-speed imaging camera to, on the shotography line um, as a, just what's going on. Um, and then we also use a streaked camera because it gives us better temporal resolution to measure the, um, the velocities. So uh, it's, it's not super exciting. These are timing dots. Um, and um, this is the time of that bright flash from the previous uh, image. Um, this is the backlighter, um, um, uh, the, which has a, a, an unfortunate speckle pattern. So the only laser we have at the minute that's bright enough is the one that's suitable for the visor. So uh, we'd like to have a less coherent laser, so we get rid of that and get a bit of geography, but nothing else we have is bright enough. And then basically what you see is this straight line is the shock, um, occluding the backlighter. Um, and this is, what you, this is what we hope to see, basically. So we want a straight line. That means we have a shock with a sustained pressure behind it. If it's kind of a blast wave type shock, what you see is this, is this um, slowing down over time. Um, what we need for our targets is a sustained uh, pressure pulse. Uh, so yeah, um, our, our uh, present uh, launch performance uh, numbers. Um, so um, we think we're getting velocities up to about 15 kilometers per second at impact. Uh, that's sustained impact pressures about um, uh, 100 gigapascals, uh, which is one megabar, I think. Um, and we have got higher pressures than that, uh, but they're with this blast wave profile. So we're trying to kind of understand the parameter space of this system to try and optimize. And I'll just to give you a, an example. Um, we made a change to the flyer thickness. We went from one millimeter to 700 microns, so 30%-ish change. And uh, the, uh, one of the pressures that we measured uh, was um, three times uh, lower in that case. So it's quite a nonlinear system. So um, also, um, we have a power loss issue. So we, we have done a lot of work to rule out what it can be. But basically, if we compare simulations and we compare simple kind of ODE models to the measured system, uh, we're getting about 50% more current than we expect. But the strange thing is that the velocity matches our predictions. So basically, we think we have a small parasitic, well, not small, a parasitic other path, um, which basically allows the, the machine to deliver more current. But actually, the current in the flyer plate doesn't seem to be very much changed by that. Um, so I don't know if anyone here knows anything about the sort of stuff. This is not unusual. Z machine has a power loss issue, which they've been trying to solve for a decade. So um, uh, we have found the same thing. Uh, it's a very different system. because It's not vacuum insulated in the load. It's insulated with plastic. Uh, so we're trying to understand what that is um, uh, at the moment. Um, 